I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's December 6th, and we have a lot to talk about. The first and most important step in living well with MS is establishing a treatment plan with your neurologist or MS specialist. And a disease-modifying therapy, or DMT, should be the foundation of that plan. Joining me to talk about what disease-modifying therapies can and can't do, and how to work with your doctor to find the best MS medication for you, is the clinical pharmacy specialist in multiple sclerosis and neuroimmunology at VCU Health in Richmond, Virginia, Ross Tingen. But before we get to my conversation with Ross, there are a few other things that you should know about. For the past several years, global warming has been front and center in the news. Now, a research team at the Cleveland Clinic has discovered that beyond having an effect on our planet, climate change has an impact on neurological health, an impact that includes people who are living with multiple sclerosis. The researchers identified 364 studies that had been carried out between 1990 and 2022 that were related to climate change, pollution, and neurological diseases. The studies were grouped into one of three different categories, extreme weather events and temperature fluctuation, emerging neuroinfectious diseases, and the impact of pollutants. Through their analysis, the team found that temperature fluctuations and extreme weather events were associated with changes in symptoms among MS patients, as well as among people with other neurological conditions. These temperature fluctuations and extreme weather events were also associated with migraine headaches, increased hospitalizations among dementia patients, and the incidence and severity of stroke. Airborne pollutants, or poor air quality, was associated with an increased risk of an MS relapse. Exposure to airborne pollutants was also associated with stroke incidence and severity, headaches, risk of dementia, and Parkinson's disease. Based on their findings, the research team identified three priorities for future research. Mitigating the spread of neuroinfectious disease, understanding how airborne pollutants affect the nervous system, and improving neurological care in a changing environment. So the next time the conversation turns to the impact of global warming, we need to start seeing that problem as something much more specific and more personal than just a change in weather patterns. This study points to the reality that it's also a change in the health and well-being of people living with MS and other neurological conditions. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. Over the past couple of years, there has been a real focus on health care equity making changes in the system and in society so that members of underserved communities have access to quality health care. And I find that sometimes when we talk about this subject, the language we use actually distances us from what's really at stake. I guess I want to call out the importance of having access to quality health care by sharing the disturbing but sadly unsurprising results of a Canadian study that examined the relationship between socioeconomic status and death among people living with MS. Now, it's easy to assume that people in higher socioeconomic strata can afford easy access to high-quality health care and therefore tend to die less frequently than people at lower socioeconomic levels. But if you're a regular listener, you know that when we talk about things on Real Talk MS— we talk about evidence-based facts and not assumptions or opinions. And a Canadian research team has recently published some evidence that's worth taking a look at. The researchers reviewed data from 12,126 people who had been diagnosed with MS between 1994 and 2017 in British Columbia, Canada. And they compared the association of different socioeconomic groups and death from all causes, 
The socioeconomic status was determined from information collected from Statistics Canada, which linked each person's postal zip code to their neighborhood income levels. Socioeconomic status was categorized by five equal groups, ranging from the least affluent to the most affluent. And the researchers discovered that a lower socioeconomic status was linked to a higher risk of death among people living with MS. In fact, the people with MS living in the neighborhood with the lowest socioeconomic status had a 61% increased risk of death compared to the people with MS who were living in the most affluent neighborhood. I've heard sociologists and healthcare researchers refer to a phenomenon they call healthcare by zip code, and this study clearly illustrates what healthcare by zip code is all about. Trying to solve this unacceptable condition entails solving a complex series of problems that extend well beyond healthcare. But the reality is that by simply being born into and living in a particular neighborhood, whether that neighborhood represents families of high socioeconomic status, low socioeconomic status, or something in the middle, well, your odds of thriving with and perhaps without MS are already fixed. And now we can point to clear evidence to support that claim. If you'd like to review this study, I'm going to include a link to a friend of the podcast, Sharon Roman's blog titled Tremlett's MS Research Explained, where you can read a plain English report of this study. And for those of you who want to dive a little deeper, I'll also include a link to the published study itself in today's show notes. Results of a study have shown that, at least in mice, Alcohol inhibits an enzyme in the liver that's necessary to break down the main ingredient in Tecfidera, dimethyl fumarate, to its active metabolite, monomethyl fumarate. Monomethyl fumarate is what drives Tecfidera's therapeutic effects, so without it, Tecfidera is not as effective. The study showed that when alcohol was present, Monomethyl fumarate was completely absent in the blood and brain tissue of the mice used in the study. This evidence strongly suggests that alcohol consumption should be avoided during those times that are close to or that coincide with the times you might take Tecfidera. And since Tecfidera is taken twice a day, that might mean simply avoiding alcohol. Now, I'll share my usual caveat regarding this very common stage in research. Mice are not the same as humans, and so we'll have to wait for these same findings to be confirmed by a study involving people. However, I'll tell you that in this case, these mice were genetically engineered to have biological processes that mimicked drug metabolism in humans, so it may not be surprising to see these findings eventually confirmed. Now, if you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. In past episodes of the podcast, we've talked about efforts among researchers to define the prodromal phase of MS. As a quick reminder, the word prodrome comes from the Greek word prodromos, which means running before. And in medicine, A prodrome is a sign or symptom or a set of signs or symptoms that indicates the onset of a disease before diagnostically specific symptoms develop. The MS prodrome would present before demyelination occurs. Actually, it would present 5 to 10 years before any typical MS symptoms would appear. And while we know that MS often impacts men and women differently, There hasn't been any research done on whether there were any health-related differences among men and women at different ages during the prodromal phase of MS. So a research team in Canada took this project on using data based upon the population of British Columbia, Canada, that's 5 million people, and they focused on sex and age-related differences in healthcare use among people living with MS and people who didn't have MS in the five years before the people living with MS were diagnosed. 
Using Canadian administrative healthcare data and data from MS clinics, the research team was able to compare 966 people living with MS with 36,399 people without MS from 1991 to 2008. The group of people without MS was matched by sex, age, and geographic area to the people who were living with MS. The two groups were divided into those people under the age of 30, people between the ages of 30 and 49, and people 50 years old and over. The researchers compared the rates of visits to the doctor. They looked at hospitalizations, both the rate of hospitalization and the reason for being hospitalized. They looked at the rate of prescriptions filled and refilled and the individual drug classes that were being prescribed. The rate of doctor visits for peripheral nervous system issues, and that's the nervous system that lies outside the brain and spinal cord, well, that was 52% higher among the men who would be diagnosed with MS five years later compared to the women who would be diagnosed with MS five years later. Men visited the doctor for burns 123% more often than women. Men had between 1.7 and 2 times the rate of hospitalizations and doctor visits for nervous system issues compared to women. Men were 39% more likely to see a doctor for genital or urinary conditions, and they were twice as likely to experience migraine headaches compared to women. Prescriptions for antidepressants were 14 to 21% higher for males than females. Females had a 49% higher rate of joint-related conditions and a 38% higher rate of ischemic heart disease or narrowing of the coronary arteries compared to the men. Visits to the doctor and hospitalizations from injury and infection were more frequent in people 50 years old and over, while cardiovascular prescriptions were more common in the younger age groups. Those people 50 and over had higher rates of skin-related disorders and spinal or torso fractures compared to the younger age groups. People under 30 were up to 45% more likely to see an eye specialist than people in older age groups. And keep in mind that studies have shown younger people are more likely to experience optic neuritis as one of the earliest signs of MS. Summarizing their study, the researchers found considerable differences in how the MS prodrome affects men and women across different age groups. In the five years before the onset of MS, overall health care use was higher in males than females and higher in older people compared to younger people. If you'd like to review this study, once again, I'm going to include a link to Sharon Roman's blog, Tremlett's MS Research Explained where you can read a plain English report of this study. And for those of you who want to dive a little deeper, I'll also include a link to the published study itself in today's show notes. Now, if you're wondering why I make it a point to include Sharon Roman's blog, it's because I can appreciate that these studies aren't written for a non-scientific audience. And getting through some of that language is challenging. Sharon and I both feel strongly that people affected by MS benefit from knowing about the advances being made in MS research, and we each in our own way do our best to translate that information into something that's easier to digest and understand. And I always want to provide a link to the actual published study results so you'll always know that the things we talk about on this podcast are supported by real data, real evidence. And whenever I see that Sharon has written up a particular study and made it easy to understand, well, I want to give you that option as well. This way, you can decide whether you want to wade into the more complex descriptions of the science, or you'd prefer reading the easier-to-understand version. One of the reasons that researchers are interested in understanding the prodromal phase of MS is that one day... If someone exhibits many of the signs associated with the MS prodrome, perhaps that person can be proactively started on a high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy that could prevent MS from ever developing. This is the sort of research that brings us closer to being able to prevent MS 
before someone experiences even one typical MS symptom. Now, that may not be a cure in the purest definition of the word, but it would certainly feel like a cure to that individual. And even then, a disease-modifying therapy would be the key to preventing MS from developing. Today, disease-modifying therapies are designed to slow the rate of progression and preserve your best quality of life longer. But with more than 20 different medications to choose from, it can feel overwhelming trying to figure out which of them might be the best choice for you. In a moment, we'll be joined by my guest, Ross Tingen, who's here to talk about how to work with your doctor to find the best disease-modifying therapy for you. The first and most important step in living well with MS is establishing and then following a treatment plan with your neurologist or MS specialist. And disease-modifying therapies, or DMTs, are the foundation of that plan. Joining me to talk about disease-modifying therapies and how to work with your doctor to find the best MS medications for you is Ross Tingen. Ross is a clinical pharmacy specialist in multiple sclerosis neuroimmunology at VCU Health in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome back to the podcast, Ross. Thank you so much for having me. I talk to a lot of people who are living with MS, and in those conversations, it sometimes becomes clear to me that not everyone is clear on the purpose of being on a DMT. So I'm hoping you'll start us off by explaining what the goal of disease-modifying therapies is and why they're so important. Yes. So one thing we do know about multiple sclerosis is really um, that it is an 85% of patients relapsing. And so the goals of disease-modifying therapy are to prevent new clinical so new symptoms, new re- clinical relapses, or radiographic relapses, which are changes on the MRI. Additionally, disease-modifying therapies are used to decrease the rate or the risk of longer-term disability. So um, we do know that those are the two main goals, is to prevent relapses and decrease our risk of going uh, or having additional disability. Research has shown us that early and ongoing treatment with a DMT can make a real difference. Why is early treatment so important? So to bring it back to the the previous question, we know that um, if we can prevent additional relapses, we can decrease that risk of um, long-term disability. So the earlier we treat, the higher the rate is of success. So if we wait a longer time, there is a higher risk of recurrent or, you know, recurrent um, disease lesions and so, you know, relapses. Um, if we keep waiting as well, you once you lose it, it's gone. And so if you start having more disability um, over time, it will be harder to get that back. And so the goal of disease-modifying therapy is really to shift that. Some people find that they're diagnosed with clinically isolated syndrome, some with relapsing remitting MS, some with secondary progressive MS, and some with primary progressive MS. Do disease-modifying therapies treat all these subtypes of MS? So every FDA-approved disease-modifying therapy is approved for relapsing forms of MS, and that is both the relapsing remitting form. Um, CIS, or clinically isolated syndrome, and what we call active, so secondary progressive MS. There is only one FDA-approved treatment currently for primary progressive MS. Today, there are more than 20 FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies. Each one carries with it its own set of side effects and risks. With all these options, choosing a DMT can sometimes feel overwhelming. What can people living with MS do to narrow down their choices? So it's very important to work with your neurologist and your neuro team. These, uh, you know, 20 different options out there, uh, it can feel very overwhelming. And so your neurologist can help you narrow those down based on your specific factors, whether it be family planning, um, comorbid diseases. So if you have other diseases such as cardiovascular disease or diabetes, Um, or, you know, what their risk is willing to tolerate. And so once the neurologist and you are able to narrow down those options that would be best for you, 
I would recommend going to other resources that are validated, such as the National MS Society's website, um, as they have, you know, non-biased information on each disease modifying therapy that you can review um, that is probably easier to understand than looking at, you know, clinical trials and things with more medical jargon. A fairly common scenario occurs when someone has been on the DMT for a few months and they start to feel frustrated because they're not feeling any different. How can you tell whether your DMT is working? So you will be able to tell when your DMT is working, when you've been on therapy and you're tolerating it well, when you are not having any new clinical symptoms, and when your MRIs are stable. Unfortunately, DMTs are not used to prevent or um, to improve previous relapse symptoms or disability symptoms um, that you're experiencing. It's really to prevent anything new from happening. And so kind of no news is good news if you're tolerating the medication well. And if it turns out that your DMT isn't working for you, perhaps you're experiencing a relapse or, or maybe there's new activity on your MRI, what are your options then? So your options will be able to change. So it's a totally different world than it was in the 90s, you know, when there was only a few drugs. Now, if you relapse, you'll have other options for your treatment. Again, it'll all come back to the conversation um, with your neurologist and neuro team on what would be one of the best options for you. Disease-modifying therapies are designed for long-term use, but the reality is that sometimes people stop or skip taking their medication. What is adhering to your medication schedule? What is it about adhering to that schedule that's so important and What are the risks if you don't adhere to your medication schedule? So when drugs are studied, they're studied in very specific ways based on how they're used in the body. And so it's important to know that if you don't take them in the way they were studied, the likelihood is they're not going to work as well. If they're not working as well because you're not able to take them, then we know that we're not going to be able to successfully prevent relapses um, or disease progression. And so it's important to Take your medications as prescribed, be as adherent as possible, um, because those that's how the drugs work. Is it ever appropriate to stop taking a DMT? There are situations where you and your neurologist may decide to stop therapy. There's some discussion about, you know, as we age, our immune systems change. And is there a possibility once we're over the age of 55 or 65 and we've been stable, can we stop therapy? But it's a very personal discussion um, that you'll have around the risks or benefits of stopping your therapy. Overall, I do not recommend stopping your therapy without talking to your neurologist first. There are two quite different approaches to treatment with a disease-modifying therapy. One approach is called induction therapy, and the other is called escalation therapy. Can you explain what each of these approaches is about? Yes. So, again, we're in a totally different environment than we were 20 years ago. We have over 20 drugs on the market. Um, We have groups of drugs, if we were to put them in buckets, that may be less efficacious but have lower risks of side effects. And then we have some drugs that are highly effective, but we're looking at longer term or higher risks of side effects. Um, And so, and with all these different drugs on the market, we're not sure which way to go. And so there are two large clinical trials ongoing looking at what we call escalation therapy or induction therapy. Escalation therapy is starting with maybe a lower efficacy drug. Um, And again, that's not a dangerous thing. We've used these drugs, we have people stable on them for decades, um, but we might use a lower efficacy drug, but it's highly tolerable. So it does great. People don't have a lot of side effects. Um, There's not a lot of issues with adherence. Um, a lot of different options there. And we would continue on that drug until there were clinical changes or relapse or changes on your MRI. And then we would escalate that drug to maybe a more efficacious drug, um, maybe a little more side effects, and then kind of going through there. The second kind of um, way that we're looking at treating MS is what we call induction therapy. And that's um, hit them hard and hit them early. So using high efficacy treatment out the gate 
um, of diagnosis. And the thought behind that is that if we give them the most efficacious treatment now, that we will prevent, we'll have the highest um, likelihood of preventing relapse or disease progression. Um, but with that, the, the concern becomes, um, you know, are they're much more immunosuppressive at those, uh, you know, at the higher efficacy treatments. There may be more monitoring involved. There may be more overall like side effects. And so um, we're not really sure which way it'll go from the clinical trials. Um, but each person is very different. Um, so when you're having conversations with your neurologist, um, it will be very personalized. And to that point, what should someone do if they feel that their personal risk tolerance doesn't match up with the DMT their neurologist has prescribed to them? That's a good question. So um, I always say that you should have a close um, working relationship with your neurologist. This is a lifelong disease, and these decisions that are made are going to affect you personally. Um, it is important that you find a neurologist that you do well with and that you get along with and they practice in a way that you, you know, are most comfortable with. I would have an open and honest conversation about your goals of therapy. What are your goals for your disease? What treatment options do you think are available? There may be very specific reasons that the neurologist recommended a specific drug, but it's good to ask and have an open line of communication. Science doesn't stop and research to identify new disease-modifying therapies is ongoing. Can you give us a preview of what's on the horizon? So the next, uh, well, air quotes, a uh, big thing coming through the, through the pipeline are what we call BTK inhibitors. There are going to be a few of them coming out, but we're a couple years out right now, um, if not three years out, and they will be immunosuppressive therapy, um, but they show some promise. And so, again, um, they'll probably be in the higher efficacy group, but we'll see how it all shakes out because we have a few years. Ross Tension, thank you for all you do to improve the lives of people living with MS, and thanks for talking with me today. Thank you so much. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 275. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening, and especially during the holiday season, please stay safe and make healthy choices.